Good morning. It is Wednesday, March the 10th, and this is The Drill. Thank you, thank you. The Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare. No demonic spirit will steal your destiny. I will foil the plans of the nations and thwart the purposes of the peoples, but my plans will stand firm forever, and the purposes of my heart will be fulfilled through all generations. I know the plans I have for you, Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Be strong and very courageous. Do not turn from my word to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Meditate on my word day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I have determined your destiny Who can thwart my plan for you? I have stretched out my hand in the way you should go. Who can turn it back? Prayer Declaration I bind and rebuke any spirit that has been assigned to abort my destiny. God will give me strength to bring forth my destiny. I will do the will of God wholeheartedly, serving the Lord, not man. The world and its desires will pass away, but I will live forever because I do the will of God. He will teach me all his ways. Amen. My name is Ron. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. And I'm your host and the only true conservative in the United States today. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, listening to to some Hugh Hewitt uh, this morning, and again, listening to Hugh Hewitt and uh, his guests, and he's playing some clips of people that are uh, providing reactions to uh, some of the bills that are being passed and to what's going on on the border. The press secretary for uh, Joe says that uh, it's heartbreaking what's going on on the border, and uh, it was... A Republican in the House that went on and saying, well, it's to be expected when you uh, come out and, and uh, don't complete the wall and you ignore uh, uh, immigration law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, for being a liberal. And there's for several other people this morning that were demonstrating how not to criticize the socialists. Uh, we are very often, and we can sense it, that being ignored by the left. Okay, because very often conservative arguments, conservative criticisms of the left are off target, way off target. I've said it before, I'll say it again, that conservatives have a tendency to criticize um, uh, the left for being not conservative enough. The criticism is uh, with the border is that, gee, if you did things the conservative way, then we wouldn't have these problems. And um, same thing with the, the bills. Well, the only problem with these bills is they're just too far left. They're, uh, they have um, all these uh, left-wing, uh, it's a wi- wi- left-wing wish list. Well, of course it is. Of course they are. This is, what, this is who they are. This is what they do. When the, the left is in charge, they move to the left and they try to move the country to the left. Reminding them that they're on on the left is not going to be persuasive. It's not going to persuade them. And everybody on the right isn't going to be a socialist anyways. You're you're preaching to the choir. We shouldn't support the bill because it has too much um, left, lefty um, pork in it, for instance. Well, nobody, no conservative is going to support what Nancy Pelosi does anyway. So... You're preaching to the choir when you're talking to the right about the bills or the border, and you're ineffective. You're just being ignored by the left 
when you go to them and say, hey, you guys are messing up because you're not conservative. They just shake that off and they keep going. The real issue is what is it they what is they doing? It's always like I said, don't ask yourself what the left is saying, what are they doing? And in this particular case, what they're doing is trying to get socialist paradise. They're going to force it, try to force it on the United States and the world. Socialist paradise. So that's the key to criticizing them, is to ask, where's paradise? Okay, we look at what's going on on the border, and you tell your lefty friends, I don't understand. I thought you guys were going to give us perfection. I thought you guys were going to give us paradise, socialist paradise. But I look at the border, I don't see paradise. I see misery. Uh, I see children being separated from their families. I hear rumors that those children are being put in shipping containers with little windows in them, but they're, they're painted on the inside with flowers and whatnot. But children are being put into shipping containers. I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound like paradise to me. The budget, $1.9 trillion. Okay, so is $1.9 trillion going to give us socialist paradise in this country, any other country, or in the world? And if not, then how much more money do we have to spend to get there? And when is it likely to happen? That's the way you criticize them. These people put tremendous amounts of pressure on themselves, whether they realize it or not, because they're perfectionists. This is again why I say that uh, don't get all shaky that the, the left has... The left is in town, right? Uh, what is it, uh, the song, the boys are back in town, the left is back in town. Don't get all shaky about that. Because remember, they're perfectionists. They want everything done just so. And it bogs them down. They can't get anything done in a timely manner because it, everything has to be perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good for the left. So you take advantage of that pressure that they put on themselves by adding to it. Then you can also ask them, ask them the question, why do you submit to all this pressure? Why do you allow yourself to be pressured like this, to go after a goal you know is unattainable? You know there's not going to be any paradise, not conservative, not socialist, not libertarian, not objectivist, not communitarian, nothing. There will be no paradise. There will be no perfection. Look what's happened in California as an example is that um, with the vaccines, right? The, California is now back down the 42nd rate, now 42nd in the nation in terms of getting the, the vaccines distributed, getting people the shots. Why? Because Sacramento, the liberals in Sacramento want to do it perfectly. Of course, there is no such thing as perfect. It needs to just get done. But they can't get their mind around that. It has to be done perfectly. So they have color codes. And they have uh, lists. You actually have to call the government and find out where you are on the list to find out when you can go ahead to make an appointment to get the shot. Instead of doing things simple, easy, may not be um, perfect, but it's effective. Instead of doing things effectively, everything has to be part of socialist dogma. One of, the, one of the things we got in California is equity. That's the new catchword, watchword, equity. Everything has to be done equitably. We can't come out of the purple phase until a county can't come out until a minority, let's say Hispanics, you have, let's say, a high uh, incidence of coronavirus in the Hispanic community in East Los Angeles. Well, until they, theirs comes down, you can't go to the red section because everything, again, has to be perfectly 
what we called in school even Stephen. But it's perfect, perfection. He has to be perfect so nothing gets done. The economy in this country suffers. The psychology of the people, not in this country, in the state, suffers. The psychology of the people suffers um, suicides, uh, etc., because the state has decided that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Instead of being effective, getting things done, get the schools open, get the economy going again, no, equity is more important. Perfection, socialist perfection is more important. And uh, it really isn't. So, but that's the way you, you're going to talk to the to your socialist buddies. Hey, where's the perfection on the border? Where's the perfection in the budget? Why are you giving money to all these other countries and for all these other causes? How is How does that develop into socialist paradise? Why $1.9 trillion? Is that going to be enough to get us to paradise, to perfection? Or are we going to need to spend more money? You approach it from that direction. You don't complain to them that the, that the only thing wrong with them is they're not conservative enough because they're going to ignore you. There's no point to do anything else. Thank you, thank you. And uh, another word about why it is that uh, socialism doesn't work and, and will never work. And that's because of Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote books, the Capitalist Manifesto and all this other, or the Communist Manifesto and uh, whatnot. And, but his, his grand narrative was about the struggle between capitalism and communism and how communism would eventually win. And that's it. Basically, then it's the end. He says that capitalism wins and then there's going to be some sort of government that will eventually wither away and leave us with basically anarchy. Okay, and people peaceably trade amongst themselves and this this will be, uh, his this is his description of uh, paradise. So, he gives a lot of uh, thought to revolution to being a revolutionary, how to gain power, how to overthrow various regimes and, and overthrow the capitalists. But he gives no thought to what to do when you've won the war, when you've won the revolution. Now that you've won the revolution and you look out over the smoking ruins, now what? Now what? And this is one of the reasons, probably the primary reason that Socialism always fails, always. Because there's no instruction from Marx on what to do now. Look at what's going on in California. The lefties own the state, but they don't know what to do. They're supposed to be creating paradise or paving the road to paradise, but instead they're paving the road to hell. More feces, needles, crime rates going up, and all they can talk about is equity and uh, mass incarceration. Fictions like that. Fine. Where's the paradise? And by the way, the guy that's uh, George Gascon has uh, been served with papers, uh, or served with notice of intent to recall. And uh, apparently within a month, they'll have the, uh, the signature gathering will start in earnest to have him recalled which is good. I hate George Gascon. Uh, I hate everything that he stands for because all he stands for is, again, uh, taking the, the county straight to hell. He, uh, I hate incompetence. And he is the incompetent in chief in this, in this county. And uh, he deserves to be recalled. He deserves a lot worse at a, at a minimum he deserves to be recalled. But anyways, this is the this is the left. Whether you're talking about a DA or you're talking about governor of the state or president of the United States, the left doesn't know what to do once they gain power. They have no clue. They have no clue. Uh, 
you look at Castro. Castro in Cuba, when he first took over, he wanted to be buddies with the United States. And the United States said, jam it. So he said, okay, then we're going to be buddies with the Soviet Union. We're going to go socialist. So he goes through this revolution, and then once he wins, again, he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what it is that he's supposed to do. Because Karl Marx didn't leave any instructions for what to do when you win the revolution. Another good reason not to be a revolutionary. Okay, because there's nothing at the end of the road. Just more questions. Thank you, thank you, and I am going to read chapter one now of the book that I um, brought to your attention uh, yesterday or the day before uh, called The Ten Commandments of Liberal Christianity. Chapter one, Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. Let's jump right into the first commandment. Jesus is a model for living more more than an object of worship. In many ways, this is a fitting first commandment for progressive Christianity. When given the choice between worshiping Jesus, which requires that he is divine, and merely looking at Jesus as a good moral guide, liberals have always favored the latter. Of course, one might object that this first commandment isn't really uh, rejecting the divinity of Jesus because of the phrase, more than. Could it be that progressive Christianity affirms the divinity of Jesus, but just puts the priority on his moral example? Not according to Gully's book. Plainly and unabashedly, Gully rejects the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Jesus, and the miracles of Jesus as myths designed to elevate Jesus to a, quote, divine status, unquote. Indeed, Gully insists that the church, quote, the church's worship of Jesus is something he would not have favored, unquote. So it's clear that the progressives are not merely putting the priority on Jesus as a moral example. Rather, they are directly rejecting the divine status of Jesus. And such a move is nothing new. In Machen's day, this is also how liberal Christianity operated. Quote, liberalism regards him as an example and a guide. Christianity is a savior. Liberalism makes him an example for faith, and Christianity the object of faith. Unquote. But we must dive deeper into this issue. Does Christianity work if Jesus is simply a moral example? Several problems arise here. We can begin by acknowledging that Jesus was, of course, a moral example for his followers. Indeed, he often called his followers to do what he has done. Uh, And he cites John 13, verse 15. But is Jesus merely a moral example? Or to put it differently, do the Gospels present Jesus as just a wise sage, a Gandhi-like figure offering tips for practical living? An honest reading of the uh, Gospel shows that the answer to this is a resounding no. Indeed, throughout those texts, Jesus is presented as not merely a good teacher, but as the divine Lord of heaven and earth. Aside from the obvious uh, John passages in John that show this, scholars have argued that Jesus' divinity is also evident in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As just one example Michael Byrd's recent book, Jesus the Eternal Son, has argued that even Mark, often thought to be the gospel which presents the most human Jesus, offers a decidedly high Christiology. Jesus is the Lord, Yahweh, visiting his people, the one who forgives sins, the rulers of the wind and the waves, and the judge of all the universe. This reality led C.S. Lewis to offer his well-known quote on Jesus as, quote, just, unquote, a good moral teacher. Quote, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, 
but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be great moral a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with uh, the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice, unquote. Well, the first commandment of progressive Christianity seems quite hesitant about worshiping Jesus. That is not how the earliest Christians felt. Indeed, because Jesus was viewed as their Lord, they unreservedly devoted themselves to worshiping him. And here's the kicker. The earliest Christians did this while also being fully committed to monotheism. Even as Jews, they worshiped Jesus precisely because they believed he was the one true God of Israel. We should also note that Jesus never rejected this worship, nor did he seem sheepish, uncomfortable, or hesitant about it. He welcomed it without reservation. And this, uh, this the, there's, uh, they cite some examples. The Magi worshiped Jesus in Matthew. The disciples worshiped Jesus on the boat in Matthew. Disciples worshiped Jesus after his resurrection in Matthew and Luke. The man born blind worships Jesus in John. Every knee will bow in worship of the Lord Jesus. Philippians. The angels worship Jesus. Hebrews. Virtually the entire book of Revelation is about the worship of Jesus. And this quick sampling does not even consider the numerous doxological declarations offered to Jesus, nor does it consider worship practices of the earliest Christians showing the type of devotion to Christ that is reserved for God alone. While liberal Christians make much of Jesus' moral example, what is so oddly missing in their system is why anyone should care. After all, if Jesus is just a, an ordinary man, why would we think that his uh, particular moral code is any better than anyone else's? Why should we think his moral code matters at all? Indeed, it not it uh, the progressive Christian system that is always pushing back against people who make absolute moral claims? Morality is relative, we are told. Morality is ever-changing and culturally conditioned. There is no one true morality. Don't push your morality onto me. So why should Jesus get a pass? Why do such criticisms not apply to him if he is just another human being like us? I suppose one could argue that Jesus has moral authority, not because he is divine, but because he's a prophet from God. But how does one know he is a prophet from God? Scripture is the only way we know enough about Jesus to draw such a conclusion. This, of course, just raises the question of what progressives think about Scripture. Many progressives don't take Scripture as reliable and plainly reject its inspiration. And if scripture is unreliable and uninspired, how do they know Jesus is a prophet? Other progressives might want to claim that they accept the inspiration of scripture. But if they do that, why don't they accept the plain teaching of uh, scripture that Jesus is not just a prophet? Why don't they accept the passages above that show Jesus as the all-deserving object of worship? Either way, the progressive Christian, uh, the progressive Jesus is just a good moral teacher approach simply doesn't work. On top of all this, one might understandably be confused by the progressive appeal to Jesus as a guide for morality when many progressives won't, in fact, follow Jesus' moral teaching. For example, are progressives willing to stand by Jesus' plain teaching that marriage is between a man and a woman in Matthew, or that he is the only way of salvation in John. If not, then why the eagerness to appeal to him as a moral teacher? Here's where we come to the most foundational problem with this first tenet. By removing the person of Jesus from the equation as an object of worship, it essentially makes Christianity a religion of moralism. What matters most, we are told, is not doctrine or theology, but behavior, deeds over creeds. But this is absolutely contrary to historic Christianity, which is the religion of grace, not a religion of merit. 
is not primarily about what we do, but what God has done in Christ. Or, in the words of John, quote, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, unquote. Machen himself captured it well. Quote, here is found the most fundamental difference between liberalism and Christianity. Liberalism is altogether in the imperative mood, while Christianity begins with a triumphant indicative. Liberalism appeals to man's will, while Christianity announces first a gracious act of God. Unquote. This first commandment of progressive Christianity precisely reflects what has been happening in the Western world for more than a century. It represents yet another vain attempt to preserve Jesus' morality while jettisoning, jettisoning his divinity, uh, divine identity. In the end, this simply doesn't work. Jesus' moral teaching only works when we retain his identity as Lord. The two should never and can never be split apart. Quote, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Unquote. Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. And um, so that chapter, every chapter in this particular book, again, it's highly recommended reading. The Ten Commandments of Liberal Christianity because it is foundational. It really gets to the heart of the differences between being a conservative and being a liberal. I'm, um, I heard about, I didn't watch because I just, to me, it was a People magazine kind of thing. The uh, Duke and Duchess of Sussex interview with Oprah Winfrey. But, uh, and I've seen things on Twitter and I heard some analysis of it from uh, Hugh Hewitt and, of course, heard the, the quote about um, Archie. So um, this seems to me, there's something about the, the whole thing that really seems out of character and, and makes me suspicious that um, the story is, if not fabricated, then certainly uh, misrepresented, that they're misrepresenting the circumstances or whatever of whomever, because they, again, they refuse to provide details, so it's very difficult to comment on. So you're in a position where it seems as though somebody's lying. Either the Duke and Duchess of Sussex are lying, or if uh, there's a denial that comes from um, uh, the Buckingham Palace, then the um, then they must be lying, that kind of thing. Also, I think it would be the wisest thing to do for the Buckingham Palace just to say nothing. Uh, the, what the Duke and Duchess of Sussex did was making an arbitrary allegation. They produced no evidence, no evidence whatsoever um, about, about this alleged comment. Now, um, she said about the, they wondered about the skin color of the baby. So we're, let's get to the specifics of this. Something about this, the way she presented it, uh, made me think n that something's not quite right here. These are not... This isn't the 1950s or the 1800s or whatever. Uh, people are uh, much more, let's call it sophisticated than that. But their sounds, it has the ring of truth to it. And this is what the left likes to do. The left likes to uh, tell not the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but they tell a part truth. They'll tell truth and then surround it with lies, or they'll tell only, again, a partial truth truth uh, about it. And that way, it, their lie ends up having more credibility uh, to it. So I think that's what's going on here is that uh, worldwide, there's a lot of urgency on the left. The left is in a big, big hurry all of a sudden to get things done that they hadn't been in in the past 50 years. I haven't seen this kind of urgency on the part of the left ever in my life. So everywhere you turn, there's, you know, these big dramatic moves by the left to, to do all kinds of crazy things and to get it all done right now. And uh, so 
um, that means there's a lot of pressure. And there's normally a lot of pressure on the left to begin with because, after all, they are the ones that are looking for socialist paradise, not people on the right. Conservatives were not. We take each day as it comes. We change when change is na- absolutely necessary. So the left is out there. Uh, they realize, hey, it's, it's like it, it's as though they were promised their parents they're going to be home at uh, midnight uh, or that they need to be in bed by midnight and they still haven't gotten half their homework done. So there's mad scramble to try to get get everything done within the time frame. So um, I believe, again, that uh, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and everybody, it seems, in that royal household, uh, Prince Charles, et cetera, are all flaming liberals anyways. So that's another reason why I suspect that this is not quite um, the, the whole truth here, what, what uh, the Duchess of Sussex was saying. But anyways... So she's a, a, a liberal, and people, I am sure, have gone to her and demanded, have gone to her and said, you will do something to help the left, to help the radical left. You're a, you're a, a duchess, you're out uh, making lots of money, you live high on the hog, you have all your fancy friends, you're an actress, you've just inked a deal for this or that or the other thing, you're going to make a contribution, you're going to make a sacrifice, as it were. So you're going to sit down with Oprah Winfrey and you are going to make a white supremacy allegation. Okay, a vague, it's a vague white supremacy allegation, but that's basically what this is. This all comes back down to the one thing that seems to be going around the planet and that is white supremacy. Okay, Um, so uh, in England they have uh, for football games all the players take a knee before the game starts, and it's supposed to show solidarity against racism. So, um, And so here's the same thing. Here's, here's this vague allegation of white supremacy. Now, as far as the believability part of this, I think that uh, did people speculate on the color of the child? I think perhaps indirectly. I think that when people get together, and they probably had some kind of a get-together to celebrate the pending birth of, you know, a shower type thing or whatever, uh, and the family got together. And there's always speculation as to whom the baby or who the baby will favor. Not whom, I guess. And whether it will be the mother or whether the baby will favor the father. And in this particular case, there's uh, mom, although she doesn't look, um, you know, she could, I suppose, pass for white, but uh, dark hair and dark eyes, darker definitely than her husband. So this going to be a natural question. Is the baby going to be more on the light skin side or is the baby going to be more uh, on the darker skin side like her mother? Who is the baby going to favor? And then because when the baby uh, is born, immediately those uh, people go in and look and say, oh, yes, she's got her mother's eyes or he's he's got his dad's chin or whatever so and i'm sure the skin coloring part of it was along the same lines it was just an offhand innocent uh, remark uh that again everybody makes on the birth of uh, or pending birth of a child who is a child going to favor and i'm sure that was what was going on with archie is archie going to favor more favor his dad or he's going to more favor his mother. And then mom, under pressure from the wacko left, sits down and makes this situation seem nefarious by adding some mystery. No, no, I, I won't discuss who said it or where I heard it. or you know, Creating all this mystery makes it sound really, really nefarious. And it's something that was probably fairly innocent. And I feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for the Duchess and the Duke of Sussex because I imagine that, again, they are under tremendous amounts of pressure from the, the wacko left. Um, so, and that everybody, I, it's, it's got to be miserable to be a lefty anywhere in the world today. Because I'm sure that you are, particularly if you're a prominent lefty, then you're going to be set upon by the likes of George Soros and all these wacko uh, tech guys to uh, put up or shut up kind of thing. Either do what we tell you to do or we're going to turn on you kind of a situation. Nobody wants that. It's like uh, LeBron James. 
BLM is, is not after me. Uh, BLM looks to LeBron James and Oprah Winfrey and people like that and uh, demands their obedience, their conformity to what they want. And the, the threat is, is implicit. It's you, uh, you will uh, do what we tell you to do or else. We're going to be surrounding your house. We're going to be threatening your family. And LeBron James knows that. He's an intelligent man, and he knows that if he even peeps in a different direction, if he's not seen wearing a BLM T-shirt every day, then uh, there very could, uh, very well could be um, these BLM protesters surrounding his house, like they did with Jackie Lacey, for instance. They're not even afraid of the district attorney. There's no way they're going to be afraid of somebody that uh, plays for the Lakers, a basketball player is what it's going to come down to for them. So he knows he's got to uh, do his duty, so to speak, and keep these radicals at bay. And I'm sure it's the same thing for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Nobody wants to see BLM on their porch. Nobody. Okay, so if there's even a hint, somebody comes, even comes along, suggests that maybe there's going to be protesters showing up at your door um, no, you're going to do whatever they tell you to do to make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. That uh, brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. Until next time, be honest, be smart, be beautiful. I'm Ron, and that's The Drill. The Drill.